welcome to the next video series I'm doing. This is Translators and Facilities of Languages, starting with a little introduction to what translators do. So essentially, this is all about how computers take the high-level source code that we write and transform it into a way that the computer can understand. So we have to think about levels of programming language. So at the bottom here, we have machine code. This is the only thing that your computer will understand, zeros and ones, binary. But this is really difficult for people to understand or work with. So we developed things like over here where we have assembler. Now assembler is still pretty difficult to understand, but it's using some letters, some words. It's a bit more understandable than machine code, but it's still difficult. So we've developed higher level languages, things that we're familiar with from our classes like Python, C++, Java, that are much easier to understand. But of course, everything has to be converted into machine code before it can be run. So let's go through that in a bit more detail in the next few lessons. So let's start by looking at low-level languages. An instruction running inside a CPU is in binary. So, for example, we've got a sequence of ones and zeros. When we give the computer instructions in pure binary, we call this machine code or machine instructions. We can call this an example of a low level language because it works deep down on the hardware level. A low level language provides little or no abstraction from a computer's instruction set architecture. So, remember, there is a limited number of instructions. The instruction set built into a CPU, and it can only understand those specific instructions. So a low-level language works with those instructions only. So machine code instructions consist of two parts. So we've got a sequence of ones and zeros. We can break it into two. The first part is the opcode. The second part is the operand. The opcode or operation code tells the computer what operation to do. It's the instruction, load, add, subtract, etc. The operand is the data that the computer has to uh, use with the opcode. So sometimes the operand could be the data itself, or more usually it's the memory address, the location in memory where to find the data to work with. Each type of CPU uses different binary numbers to represent particular instructions. So the opcode for one family of CPUs will be different from the opcode for the same instruction from another family of CPUs. This means the machine code written for one type of CPU will not run on another type of CPU. It would have to be rewritten first. So if you've got a whole set of binary sequences machine code written for the, say, Intel platform, you can't take those ones and zeros and run them on a ARM processor, for example, on your iPad, because the instructions are just different. The numbers don't match. Key point here, people find it difficult to write programs or maintain, maintain code written in machine code. So let's look at two fairly early examples of computers. We've got one by Honeywell and one by Altair. Now, both of these work in a similar way. We give data to the computer by inputting binary data. We have these switches. Uh, off is 0, on is 1. So you input the data using these binary switches. And the same with this computer over here. When the computer is finished calculating your instructions, it displays the answers using LED lights. So again, the lights will flash on and off in sequence, giving you ones and zeros, which you then need to work out what the answer is in a form that we understand. Now, clearly, for most people, working out what you want the computer to do, looking up all the opcode, working out what the, all the operands are, inputting that data in using switches, waiting for the computer to process it, and then looking at the lights, trying to work out what those lights mean, what that data is, is extremely difficult. It's not user-friendly, and you have to be an expert in order to use that. Another example here of why working machine code is different, we have a binary punch card. 
So again, you have to work out the ones and zeros needed to work out your program, and then you punch the card in all the right places, so you've got your zeros and your ones, and you take those cards, which might be dozens, hundreds, or thousands of cards, and you feed it into a computer so it can run your code. Sound fun? Not really. So because of that, we, tr we developed languages that are more easy for us understand. One of the very first we had developed was called assembly. Assembly is still close to machine code. It's a very low level language, but it is easier to understand. Assembly language consists of sets, sorry, consists of a set of mnemonic instructions, each of which has a machine code equivalent. So for example, here, we've got the operands, but instead of the operands being a set of ones and zeros, we're using these mnemonics. So MOV, CLR, JMP, etc. These have a one-to-one -one relationship between a binary opcode and a machine code opcode like this. But because it's not ones and zeros, because it's letters, it's short words, it's a bit easier to understand. So we take a look, say, one of these, this one here. We're moving data. Again, we've got the operand here. This is the data. And we're going to move this into register number five. So straight away, this is a bit easier to understand than ones and zeros, but it's still something you have to try and work out. It's still quite difficult. It has a low level of abstraction, that is assembly. There is a direct link between the instructions in assembly and the machine code which it represents. There's a one-to-one -one instruction. So if you go back here, each one of these lines would translate into one line of machine code. There's a one-to-one -one relationship. Programs written in assembly run very quickly, but the code is very difficult to write or update. It is also machine-specific. Again, each CPU family has its own instruction set. You also have the issue that there are no code libraries to take advantage of. When you're working with Python or Java or many other high-level languages, you can incorporate code that other people have written and use that. You don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. But if you're working in a low-level language, you pretty much have to reinvent the wheel and write everything yourself from scratch each time. However, we still use low-level languages. We still use assembly. So, for example, a type of program that might still be written in assembly is a device driver. So we should remember device drivers from talking about system software. These are programs that directly control hardware, such as graphics card, keyboards, mice, printers. Uh, they kind of interface between the operating system and the hardware. These drivers need to be as fast and as efficient as possible. So assembly language is a good choice to create this because it's a very fast, efficient language. Later, of course, we developed higher level languages that are much closer to natural language and can be read much more easily by humans. C, Python, Java, etc. are all examples of this. Programs written in high level languages are slower than assembly. They have to be converted through into machine code. This process isn't as efficient as doing it with assembly because assembly has that one-to-one -one relationship. So higher level languages are slower to run than low-level languages. However, they are much easier to program and much easier to maintain, fix, update. So though the program might run a little bit more slowly, it's much, much faster to develop the program, test it, debug it, get it working. So that's why now most people in most situations program in high-level languages. They also have code libraries available, code that's already been written and can be added to your own code. Some high-level languages are also what we call machine independent. Once written, they can run on many different types of computer. So for example, Java or languages using Microsoft's .NET framework can run on lots of different machines very easily. Today, most programs are written using high-level languages. However, Again, another key point here, whether a program is written in a high-level language or in assembly, computers only understand binary. So computers only understand sequences of ones and zeros. That's it. 
So if we write a programming a program in any other language, assembly, C++, Java, it still has to be converted to binary before the computer can understand it. So translators are the programs used to convert programming source code from a higher level language into machine code for the computer to process. And there are three types of translator we need to know about. Assemblers. These translate low-level assembly code into machine code. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? An assembler takes assembly code, translates into machine code. Easy peasy. And then we have compilers and interpreters. Both compilers and interpreters take high-level source code and translate into machine code. But compilers translate an entire high-level program into machine code in one go, whereas interpreters translate the high-level program into machine code line by line as they're run in real time. And we'll go through that in a little bit more detail. So here's a nice little kind of image I found online, just kind of comparing compilers, interpreters, and assemblers. So again, make any notes that you need. Feel free to watch bits of the video again. I will continue with this in the next lesson.